Welcome to the Best Little Town Podcast, your go-to source for everything happening in the town of Bedford's local government. Whether it's new initiatives or important decisions shaping our town's future, you'll hear it right here. This podcast is dedicated to keeping our residents informed and engaged. Hello, it is Wednesday, October 23rd. My name is Bart Warner. I have the privilege of serving as the town manager of the town of Bedford, and this is the Best Little Town podcast, which is brought to you by the town of Bedford and our partners with Media Squatch in an effort to provide as much information as possible to our citizens, businesses, and interested parties regarding the inner workings and goings on of the town of Bedford government. We accomplish that basically by providing a recap of each council meeting the morning after it happens, and that's what we're going to do today, and I'm going to jump right into it. Beginning last night, I reported by stating the annual reminder that some communities in Virginia choose the date, time, and other restrictions associated with Halloween trick-or-treating, but the town of Bedford does not. However, we recognize that on October 31st, people typically on their own do things that impact the community. So we encourage those who choose to participate in trick-or-treating to plan ahead and exercise caution. Citizens are encouraged to use flashlights when walking on neighborhood streets and to supervise children as they go from house to house. Town also encourages those driving around the community during the evening hours on October 31st to exercise extra caution in light of potential weather-related concerns, as well as the likely presence of trick-or-treaters on or near neighborhood streets. So to clarify, the town does not take an active role in establishing or acknowledging Halloween as a holiday, but we're aware that a significant portion of our population does do so, and we plan accordingly. Uh, We'll point out some specific areas in town merit particular attention, notably Longwood Avenue. That sees a lot of activity on October 31st. We would ask folks who are bringing children, particularly young children, that you Don't just drop them off and let them go, given the wide space of that street, the fact that it is a main route to Bedford Memorial Hospital, and the fact that we see a lot of traffic. In other administrative matters, between now and the next regular council meeting, town offices will be closed on two occasions in observance of state-recognized holidays. The first of those will be Tuesday, November 5th. That is Election Day. And while you have the ability to vote right now, if you haven't done so by November 5th, we certainly encourage you to exercise your rights and make sure you do so. The second instance will be Monday, November 11th, which is Veterans Day. Uh, Town offices are closed. Also, the National D-Day Memorial will be hosting an event up on site that morning, which might be worth checking out. We would encourage you to look at their website, www.dday.org, for further details. Moving forward into the agenda, we had a few folks who appeared to speak before council. The first was Ms. Jane McKeon. She expressed her concerns about progress on the Bedford Middle School Redevelopment Project and shared her opinion that the developer is probably not moving as fast as they should be and expressed concerns about the security of the building while they are acting there. She also shared her concerns about budget issues, specifically the amount of money spent on the design of a police department building that has not proceeded and has not been discussed further. Uh, Shared her opinion and her views that that money could have been available for other priorities and projects. Mr. Jonathan Hayden also came to speak and provided some great background information on the Christmas tree lighting event that takes place the first Saturday of December every year. Jonathan is actually the person that does that event almost single-handedly. He does most of the prep work, does all the planning, is actually there to carry off the lighting. He provides DJ services in conjunction with it. And John does a great job, and there were comments later from council expressing appreciation for that, but he's asking for help from the community. He stated he sees it as a Town of Bedford event and notes that the town typically gets the recognition for the decorations and efforts. 
He would like to see that become bigger and better. For, bigger and better. Sorry, Bedford was on my mind there. And would like to have a conversation and collaboration with town council and staff next year about doing so. Also last night, we had Pastor Joe Whiting from Chambelsburg Baptist Church who read scripture, this time Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, and offered prayer on behalf of council and the community. Council members had an opportunity to share their comments and anything on their mind last night. And going around the dais, Bruce Johansson noted that the community is blessed with folks who contribute great work to the community and great effort. That is, the results of that are seen, but those folks, probably don't receive the individual recognition that they should. As a few examples, he cited Jonathan Hayden, also Jim Ravel with the Bedford Urban Gardens, and Fred Dewis with the Wharton Garden as examples of people who go out of their way to make Bedford look good and to contribute to the life of the community, and they do so out of the goodness of their heart with very little recognition. Vice Mayor C.G. Stanley thanked Pastor Whiting for his prayer and his thoughts on behalf of the town. He stated that he certainly appreciates Jonathan Hayden's efforts and supports any ideas about expanding the good things that are happening in town that John's a part of. And he also thanked Mrs. McKeon for expressing her concerns. Councilman Stacy Haley also offered thanks for the prayer and extended appreciation to Jonathan Hayden. And he thanked the candidates for council who were present at last night's meeting. Councilman Bob Carson also thanked the people who were in attendance at the meeting. Thanks, extended thanks to Jane McKeon for providing her perspective. Thanks to Jonathan Hayden for doing what he does. Mr. Carson noted that he sees the tree lighting as a town function and wants to make sure that the town does all it can to provide support as soon as possible, and this year, if possible. Councilman Darrell Updike also gave thanks to the people who were physically present at the meeting and also thank the people who present the events throughout the year within our town limits. Mayor Tim Black noted that Bedford Middle School redevelopment project will be an ongoing topic of discussion within the remaining months this year, as well as at the beginning of the year as we look at the performance agreement related to that project. Tim noted that we're scheduling a work session prior to the November meeting. The purpose of that is to bring in the folks who will be elected, newly elected to council and who will take office in January to talk about some of the ongoing projects, some of the things coming up in the future, and to hopefully guide a smooth transition as we have three members of council who will be stepping down. Those three are Mayor Black, Councilman Bruce Johansson, and Councilman Bob Carson. Councilman Todd Foreman is running for re-election. Basically, as of November 12th, which will be the next meeting date, we should have the results of our local election. And so we want to do what we can to bring on the new folks and get them the information they need to serve the community. And of course, we will certainly thank them for that service and willingness of all people to step up and provide service to the community at that time. Tim noted that we continue to discuss ideas about the police department facilities, um, the need for a new station. Tim expressed his opinion that the police department will need a new facility at some point. In response to uh, Mr. Hayden's comments and as well as Mr. Carson's expression that we should probably do what we can to, to help with the Christmas tree lighting as soon as possible, Tim noted that the council has a line item in its budget, which is $5,000, and it's entitled miscellaneous, that the council could offer for assistance to Mr. Hayden. The consensus of members of council was to do that. And staff was directed to coordinate with Jonathan Hayden directly and report back in November to see what we can do to help with that event. Moving on through the rest of the agenda, there were no council committee meetings prior to this meeting and there were no revisions to the agenda. So we got right into the meat of things with the business portion. The first item was a public hearing 
uh, concerning a budget amendment related to several grants that the town has obtained from both federal and state entities to conduct some significant projects that we otherwise probably couldn't take on ourselves with local taxes. In order to do this, we have to amend our budget to incorporate those, and that also relates to our process. You know, we're bound by fiscal year, which begins July 1st and ends June 30th of every year. These particular budgets, which are significant, were largely awarded and expected to be expended within the period that ended June 30th, this current year, but that did not occur, so we need to roll those over to make sure we don't lose the funding, and we also continue the work that's provided by these funds. The total amount of the grants that we were talking about is $9,355,993.48. And again, in order to do that, we have to go through an administrative process to amend the budget. Part of that is a public hearing. It's worth noting that nobody spoke last night at the public hearing because Apparently, nobody objects to getting money from other sources that don't come from town taxes. The next item of new business was a celebration and a proclamation of one of our citizens, that being Savator S. Lowry. Ms. Lowry is celebrating her 100th birthday on October 30th, and Mayor Black read a proclamation noting that she is a lifelong Bedford Town resident and she worked for McCormick Foods, formerly Golden West Foods, has served as a dedicated member of Washington Street Baptist Church congregation, and enjoys traveling, preparing holiday dinners for her family, and spending time reading her Bible. And Tim presented a framed copy of the proclamation to uh, Ivan Green, who was one of Miss Lowry's relatives, and Mr. Green was very gracious and thanked counsel on her behalf and noted that he would present that to her on the occasion of her birthday get-together, presumably this weekend. The next item of new business was the administrative act related to the public hearing I just described, and that was the grant rollover and appropriation of the various grants, uh, the most significant of which are a grant from the Virginia Department of Transportation for refurbishing the bridge that spans the railroad tracks and connects McGee Street to Orange Street. Some people may not be terribly familiar with that bridge in its, its existing form. It is a one-lane wooden bridge that might have been put there around 1915. Uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge for motorists for years, and in fact, the bridge has been closed since 2019, due to concerns about the structural integrity of it. In response to that, we worked with our partners in VDOT through the State of Good Repair program to obtain $3.3 million in grant funding from VDOT. That does not require any town match and involves no appropriation of local town funds. As I commented at last night's meeting, uh, the good news is it's basically free money for the town. The downside is it takes a little while to get the work done. Bridge has been closed since 2019. Construction is scheduled to kick off next year in September, and that be, would be September of 2025. So it's highly likely we're going to be doing another rollover to keep these funds fresh and active. The other significant grant we mentioned last night and approved was a $4.8 million grant from FEMA for hazard mitigation. That's the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And this is to provide additional electric infrastructure for Bedford Memorial Hospital. That would include backup generators to make sure that on the unlikely event that power goes out, it won't affect our primary health care facility here in town. And that also provides funding to provide some redundant circuitry there. Again, the idea here is to make sure that Bedford Memorial Hospital, which is a great asset for all our citizens, is able to function even under periods of emergency, or in those instances when power would otherwise be out. What's interesting about that is this particular grant was something that the town applied for on the hospital's behalf because the hospital as a private entity was not eligible for it. Again, this is another instance where there will be no local town funds expended. It basically is 
money that passes through. The town applied on behalf of Centra and Bedford Memorial Hospital has received the grant and will pass that money to the hospital and pass the reports back to FEMA as the work is completed. The vote last night on rolling over these grants and some others passed by unanimous vote of all council members. The next item of new business related again to another grant, that being a Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG, administered by the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. The town has received a grant of $1,071,644 for the purpose of rehabbing 11 households within a targeted area, including low to moderate income housing, I'm sorry, households. Um, this is the next phase of a very successful project that rehabbed 14 houses in this area previously. The grant was, we were notified back in September that the town received the grant and the town indicated its willingness to accept it then. And the town took the formal action to amend the budget to do so last night by a unanimous vote. In conducting the vote, Mayor Black extended his thanks to staff and I'm gonna si single out Mary Zirkel and Cantrell, and also John Wagner for their efforts to constantly find funding sources like this to provide improvements to the community that don't place a burden on our local taxpayers. The next item of new business related to an administrative matter in the electric department that is of great interest to all customers because it relates to our power cost adjustment. The power cost adjustment is something that we apply to all bills for all electric customers, and it relates to recovering the costs of doing business for the town. I'm going to step back here and provide a little bit more background on our electric operation. As many folks are aware, we do generate some of the power we use from the Snowden hydroelectric plant, from our solar facilities, and we're trying to increase that generation locally as much as we can. However, most of our power that we use, an overwhelming percentage of that, is purchased from outside entities because we don't have the ability, location, or wherewithal to do all that ourselves. Some of those contracts are in places as diverse as Ohio and Pennsylvania. And so, most recently, we approved the purchase of wind power being generated in Ohio. What we do is we secure the power that's generated there, we buy it, but that power is physically transmitted to us through infrastructure such as high voltage wires, high tension wires. Some of the big things you see some often out in the countryside, that is the physical grid that exists that we are a part of. So while we have our own local utility that is part of our local distribution system, a lot of the power we use has to come from somewhere else. And the folks who own that infrastructure are entitled to recover the costs associated with maintenance of that. And so last night, John Wagner provided some good background information on, on this that's frankly a little bit better than what I just told you about. Um, in particular, the area that we're adjacent to is managed by the Appalachian Power Company. They are in the process of upgrading that infrastructure that we benefit from. Of course, that increased those costs of transmission and those get passed along. The town has to pay that and we pass that along to the customers. So again, the power that we purchase on the customer's behalf, the town pays for up front. And then we sell that to the individual users based on their meters and what they use. Um, Mr. Wagner and council in particular are very sensitive to the impacts of that on our customers. And we want to be as upfront as possible. Um, you know, if you have any questions about power, I would certainly encourage you to reach out to our electric department and to Mr. Wagner. Um, you can email him at jwagner at bedfordva.gov. But basically what we reported last night was these transmission costs have increased to the point where we also have to eat, we have to do something with those costs ourselves. And what we did last night with our power cost adjustment was to propose that council pass along 50% of those costs right now. So there will be an increase in bills for 
customers based on this action. The average increase, Mr. Wagner presented a document that said, the average increase for residential customers will probably be something like $13 per month. The unfortunate aspect of this is we really don't have much control over these costs. They're all related to our relationship to the outside world and the fact that we can't physically generate all the power we use. The other thing that's going on that everybody needs to be aware of, and I, th I can't imagine anywhere in this country where this isn't true, is that the cost of electricity is going up and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Without getting political, the reason for that is simple economics. The demand for electricity in this country is going up exponentially on a daily basis. However, the supply of electricity is actually decreasing as generating facilities, for whatever reason, are being decommissioned and taken out of service. So, again, as, as the demand for things goes up and the supply goes down, prices go up. That is related to policy. That's related to some political discussions, which I won't weigh in on. But just want to make people aware that it is a fact that this has an impact on all consumers. And we're likely to see some more pressure on our bills coming up when we look at our PCA again. And we'll examine that in April. So just in the interest of transparency, we don't like being the bearers of bad news, but want to make people aware of what's going on and Again, not to be political, but a lot of this has to do with um, policy at the national level. So, and some of those discussions are frankly beyond my pay grade, but there really are consequences to every action, including who we vote for and how those folks vote. During the vote last night, the vote passed by a vote of six to one. Councilman Stacy Haley voted against the adjustments of the PCA. All other members of the council voted for it. The next item of new business related to acceptance of another grant, this time in the amount of $146,000 from the Department of Rail and Public Transportation for bus transit services, and that relates to the Otter Bus. Um, if you're not familiar, there is public bus service available here in town. It's administered by the Bedford Community Health Foundation in conjunction with the town of Bedford. The Otter Bus, I believe, runs, uh, I know they run on weekends, on Saturdays, on a route, and I believe it's on Tuesdays is their other primary route. Uh, you see, if you see signs around town, they're white signs with a yellow circular border and a nice logo with an otter. That's where the otter bus stops. And on those days in particular, you can get on at no cost and ride a circuit all through town that goes all the way out to the YMCA and back eastward to the Walmart. Again, this is another situation where the town was able to secure grant funding on behalf of the Health Foundation from the state because the Health Foundation was not otherwise eligible. This is money that passes through the town, and we are accountable to the state on behalf of the Health Foundation. And in this instance, it provides free bus service for anyone who wants to use it and who shows up at the stop. Uh, the bad news for... Well, yeah, bad news is that this grant runs out this year. It was a three-year program, and beginning this year, the Health Foundation is going to have to look at some ways to continue this service or to find other revenue sources or to possibly charge fares. Uh, there were some questions I asked last night about usage statistics and how many people actually ride the bus. We're going to research that and report at the meeting on November 12th. Anecdotally, it has been very useful and the health foundation folks have even talked about expanding it on a demand-based uh, operations similar to uh, uber and things like that but again we've got funding for another year to keep it free but there's going to be some discussion about how to keep that ongoing the way we're able to keep it free is by accepting this grant and council unanimously voted to do so last night The last item of new business was a resolution canceling the second council meetings in November and December. Those meetings were scheduled to take place November 26th, which is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, and December 24th, which of course is Christmas Eve. Council, according to code, meets on the second and fourth Tuesdays of every month, although when they 
foresee issues with holidays or other operations in which it's not practical or unlikely that we're going to get a great turnout. Council will occasionally take action to council meetings, and they did so last night by unanimous vote. So council will meet in November on November 12th. They'll meet again the second Tuesday in December, but those will be the only meetings that take place on those months. That was passed by unanimous vote. Council did comment on next month trying to get a report on some outstanding things they've been working on that they'd like to get wrapped up. Of course, that will take place in conjunction with conversations with the newly elected council members. But in any event, there's great interest in making sure that they're being responsive to the needs of the community and accomplishing the priorities that they've identified. And council, on that note, adjourned the meeting until November 12th at 5.30 p.m. for the work session that I mentioned previously. Again, I mentioned it before, but would like to note that uh, there is an election on a national level, but also on a local level. Here in Bedford, there are four council seats that are up for, that are contested, I guess, that are up for election. Uh, Councilman Tom, Todd Foreman is running for re-election, but the other three seats are open. There are people on the ballot, and I understand there are also some write-in campaigns as well. Would encourage everybody to exercise your right to vote and to be heard. If you don't vote before then, please come on November 5th and cast your ballot at the polls. But as always, if there's something on your mind at any time, if you have a question about operations, policy, or impacts, come to our council meetings, which are usually the second and fourth Tuesday of each month at 7 o'clock p.m., upstairs in the municipal building at 215 East Main Street. Or you can call the main number at Town Hall during business hours at 540-587-6001. Or you can email me anytime at bwarner at bedfordva.gov and we'll do our best to give you the information you need. Fortunately, we can't guarantee that it's the information you will always want to hear. In any event, we'll do our best to provide the facts and to respond appropriately to the challenges that are before us and to try to overcome them. In that regard, we thank you very much for your patience and assistance. And we look forward to the next time when we can join you in this mode on the Best Little Town podcast. <laughs>